Where does Bond get started? All right, so uh, for today's class, we're going to focus on talking about how to actually execute queries in parallel in the system. Um, so real quick before we get to that, again, a reminder that in two days from now, on Wednesday, October 18th, we'll have the midterm here in class, and it will encompass the entire, uh, entire hour, and, hour and a half, hour and 20 minutes. And then project number two will be due on uh, a week from now, Wednesday, October 25th. Uh, the, everyone should have gotten an email last night about the, uh, uh, the, the last two homeworks on Gradescope have been graded and released. Uh, all the solutions for all the homeworks that are relevant to the, the midterm are available on, on the website. Um, and I'll, again, I'll be, I'll be having office hours uh, today if you want to come and ask questions. So again, the, the the exam will be here. The, you need to bring your CMU ID, a two sheets, or sorry, one single sheet, double-sided, handwritten notes. Uh, can, they cannot be typed. Um, and then a calculator to do the basic, you know, the, the logarithms you need to do the, the join cost calculations. So any, any questions at a high level about the midterm? Yes? It would not cover today's lecture. It's everything up until last, last Wednesday inclusive on query optimization. It must be handwritten, right? Because otherwise, you just copy and paste the slides, and that's not, you know, it sort of defeats the purpose of this. Anything else? Okay. So, the all the discussions we've had so far about uh, join algorithms, sorting algorithms, access methods, how to do scans, and things like that, it is all ignored or just we didn't even bother talking about threads or multi-process execution, right? We described all these things in terms of you have a single thread and wants to scan a table. Here's what it's going to need to do. Now, w in your first project, when you implemented your buffer pool, you did have to worry about uh, uh, con uh, concurrency issues. Uh, you had to worry about that, that if, you, if you have a th one thread is modifying a page, you want to pin it to make sure that another thread doesn't, in the, in the buffer pool manager, doesn't swap it out while you're making those changes. Uh, so now we can talk about uh, how we actually want to build a database system to support multiple threads uh, running at the same time and updating the database, uh, running queries, accessing things. Um, but in sort of help motivate this, and maybe this is sort of obvious at this point because it's 2017, uh, but I'd like to sort of ask, like, why do we care about parallel execution? Uh, why do we want to spend time talking about what we need to do inside our database system to allow it to support multiple things running at the same time? Right, what's, what's an, obvious, an obvious answer to this? Sorry, what's that? Say it again. He says emerging of, the emergence of distributed systems. Uh, the, f the first distributed database system was from 1979. Right? I wasn't even born yet, so it's not that. It's right. It's, yeah, you get better performance, obviously, right? And you'll know, get better performance in terms of throughput, how many queries, how many transactions you can execute per second, uh, but also you'll get better latency, meaning the time it takes from your application when it submits a query until the, to the time it takes to get actually the, the result you need back, that's going to be cut down uh, quite significantly if you can run things in parallel. So we're also going to get better increased avail availability. This will come up more when we talk about distributed systems. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by parallel systems versus distributed systems in the next slide. Um, but the other advantage also, too, is like the way Intel is getting better performance on their chips now is not ratcheting up the clock speed. Right? It's, at, it's giving you more cores. And so now if, you, if, you, if your database system can only operate on a single thread at a time, then whatever, whenever the latest chip comes out from, from, from Intel, every new Xeon update, you're not going to get any faster because maybe the, you know, the cache size might get a little bigger, so that might help you. But like, you're not taking advantage of all the extra cores that the CPU is providing you. Um, and so if you can take advantage of everything, then you can run you know, what normally we'd have to run on, say, an, on a distributed database system across multiple machines. You can now run on a, a single machine. And that means the total cost of, of deploying a database system is much less. Right, you, you're, you're being more efficient. So this is at a high level of what, what we're going to care about here. And again, sort of to what he sort of uh, uh, 
Yes, sorry. Total cost of ownership. So, so think about it this way. Uh, MySQL is free, right? It's open source. You can download and use it. Is that the total cost of what it takes to actually use it? No, because you have to buy a machine to maintain it. That machine needs energy, so you have to pay for that. Uh, then if it's, if it's complex application, then you need a, you have to pay for a human DBA to maintain it. So all those things you would encompass in total cost of ownership, right? And this is typically why, you know, people can justify paying Oracle or IBM or SQL Server a lot of money because the total cost of operating a database on those enterprise systems of just the software license is usually a small portion. It's all the other stuff that uh, starts to add up, right? The hard drive dies, you gotta buy another one, right? There's all, all, all those sorts of things. So TCO is, is typically how an enterprise will, uh, it's the metric they'll use to decide whether they wanna go for one system versus another, right? So just because something's open source doesn't mean it's always free, right? Okay, so the, as he sort of alluded to earlier, uh, there's this notion of, of parallel versus distributed database systems. And you may think that they're actually interchangeable, um, and I'm here to sort of say that they're not, and I'll explain why they're actually different. But the basic idea of this sort of class of database systems is that we're gonna spread the, the, the logical database across multiple physical uh, resources. And I'm saying resources and not machines because it could be multiple disks, it could be multiple processors, it could be multiple machines, it could be multiple uh, data centers. And by doing this, we're gonna get better parallelism and achieve all the things that I, I just mentioned in the last slide. Right? The main thing people always point to why you want a parallel system or a distributed system is, is better throughput or just better, higher capacity. And so the core, th the, the, sort of the key thing to understand about uh, these distributed database systems and one of the advantages of writing your application to use SQL queries is that the database appears as a single logical instance to the application. And you can write your SQL queries all on that, that single logical database. And your application doesn't know, and doesn't need to know, about where the data is actually stored or what, what machine's gonna execute the query or if, if, if the hardware is configured this way versus another way. And so that means, in theory, you could write your query on a test database running on a, on a single box but then if you wanted to then try it out on a, a, the production database, the live database that's scaled across a thousand machines, the same SQL query that works on uh, one machine should also work on a thousand machines. And it's up to the database management system to take your SQL query and, and figure out what data you actually need to touch and then how to route queries to that, to that right location or, or the subtasks of a query, the operators, to the right location. Now, the tricky thing will be, and we'll cover this more in the distributed databases, uh, just because, you know, it, say your, your query runs in one minute on, on one machine, doesn't mean when you go to two machines, all, all of a sudden the times will be cut in half. Right? That's certainly not the case at all. And so there's a lot of, a lot of tricky things you have to deal with when you go distributed. Uh, for our purposes here, we're gonna focus on running on a single box, but running them in parallel on different on multiple cores or multiple uh, hard drives. So the, the definition I like to use to differentiate parallel database systems versus distributed databases is the following. So a parallel database could be comprised of multiple nodes, uh, and I'll use the, node, the term node loosely, but typically maybe like you know, a machine or like a, a blade in a, in a rack server. Uh, and these nodes are gonna be really close to each other. Right, some, some high speed LAN, they're, they're either in the same rack or if you have one of those uh, blade servers, they're on the same, so the same interconnect. And so in this environment, the communication cost between the different nodes is assumed to be really small. Okay, think, think of the, 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 the smallest parallel machine you could possibly have is a two socket, two socket motherboard. And so the, two, the, the communication between the two, the cores running on one socket versus the other is really, really fast. Right? As opposed to if you have uh, one machine in Am an Amazon's data center in Virginia, another machine in Amazon's data center, data center on, on the West Coast, then the communication between those is, is really long. And so th in those kind of environments, that's what I typically refer to as a distributed database system. So 
in a distributed database environment, the communication costs and the problems of, say, unreliable communication can't be ignored in the same way that you, that you can in a parallel database. And so what I mean by that, uh, it's very often the case that the network may go down when you're talking between different data centers, and then your query that was running on two different locations now uh, you know, gets, get, has to get killed because you can't communicate with the other one. Right? Whereas in a parallel database, as we see when we talk about sort of these multi-threaded architectures, it's very unlikely that if the, if the CPU on one socket crashes, that the system can keep, keep on running right, on the other socket. Right? The whole motherboard would freak out and the OS probably would, would kill itself, right? have a kernel panic. So in that environment, we assume that we can always reliably talk with the other nodes and we can design algorithms to, to, that are based on this assumption. Whereas in, in a distributed database environment, you assume that the communication is unreliable and you have to account for that in how you, how you build things. So now, for, for, again, for this class, we're going to focus on parallel uh, database systems. Uh, in, at the end of, end of the semester, we'll talk about distributed database systems. Um, the, most of the times when people think like, in like a NoSQL system or like a Google scale system, they're typically talking about distributed database systems. But at, most modern database systems, even MySQL, SQLite, and anything that runs on a single node, they're considered parallel systems. Because right? it's not a single thread that's doing everything. So what kind of parallelism can we have? Uh, and there's essentially two categories that we're going to target here for query parallelism. The first is going to be sort of inner query parallelism. Yeah, sorry, in the back. Yeah. So his question is, are in these two categories of systems, is would one be better for OLTP and would one be better for analytical workloads? And uh, the, I would say the answer is yes. So in a parallel system, right, a, say, say you have a, a big honking server with a lot of cores and a lot of memory, uh, if all the data you need for a transaction, which we have, I haven't defined what a transaction is yet, but just assume all the, need, all the data you need to perform some operation in the application, if that's on a single box, then you can run that very quickly because you don't need to communicate with other nodes. If you want to, if you have a distributed system and you want to do a transaction like send money from my account to your account, and your account is on the west coast, my account is on the east coast, and then there's a bunch of back and forth I have to do to make sure that transaction occurs, happens correctly. That all that happens versus, you know, only, you know, you don't want uh, you know, to take money out of my account and then crash and lose that money. So there's a bunch of extra stuff which we'll talk about in two weeks in concurrency control that you have to do to make sure that happens. And that's really s bad or slow if you have to go over a wide area network. So uh, there are some systems that can do transactions in a distributed environment, but it's rare. And most of the times, OLTP databases aren't aren't that big. Right, you can probably fit them on, on a single box or a small number of boxes. For really large data sets, when people talk about big data and those kind of environments, they're typically talking about distributed databases because the size of the database exceeds the capacity of a single node. So you sort of combine a bunch of nodes together and federate them together, and now you have a distributed database that can run analytical queries. And because when you run analytical queries, they're read-only, uh, you don't have to do a bunch of extra stuff to make sure that the that everything's going to be correct and fail safe when you, when you run. Um, so yes, typically uh, parallel databases are, people want to run their transactional workloads on a, on a sm small number of machines, and that would sort of constitute a parallel database. And then for really, really large data sets, you would go to a distributed database environment. Now, of course, there's always the Google, Facebooks, Amazon, Microsoft outliers, where they have really, really large applications that that want to do transactions and they have to run in this. Um, so his question is, uh, in a distributed database environment, do I mean a, do I mean a setup where a, um, the database is broken up into shards or partitions or sort of smaller su disjoint subsets, and each node in the, in the, in the sort of the cluster or the, the, the configuration has just a, a portion of that data. 
Uh, typically, when people talk about distributed databases, that is what they're talking about, yes. Uh, again, we'll talk about more about this later in the, in the semester. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think the answer, I would say the answer is yes. Uh, his, his statement is probably not disjoint. Typically, or sometimes it is. Uh, there'll be replicas and things like that, and you can be. Say it again. So, so by disjoint, what I mean is like, say I have ten tuples, uh, I'm going to make five sh partitions or shards, and the first one has the first two, the next one has the second two, right? There's no overlap between the two of them because that makes it tricky for bookkeeping, right? Like, so partition one will have tuple one and two, partition two will have three and four. There's not going to be a partition that has two and three. So that's what I mean by disjoint. Uh, so, but again, you, you can replicate those shards on different machines. There, I'm saying there's no partition that sort of, that would, ex there typically is not a partition that spans the boundaries of two other partitions, right? There is, but that's, that's, that's complicated, okay? All right, did that answer everyone's question? So again, another thing to point out too is uh, these are not mutually exclusive. So in your distributed database system, on a node in, in the cluster, that could be, a parallel system. Typically they are, right? Because you have all these extra cores and you want to run things in parallel. Right? So they're not mutually exclusive. I just sort of, I want to highlight the point that like, there's a bunch of design decisions we have to make, it, uh, that we can make if we assume our communication is going to be fail safe and very fast. And there's other ones we have to make if we assume they're going to be, uh, the, the machines are going to have some distance from each other and we need to account for the fact that we, we may, we, we, you know, the, we may lose communication. All right, so the parallelism we're going to target in this class are, 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 are these two categories for query execution. Um, so inner query parallelism means that we're going to have, allow the database system to run multiple queries concurrently at the same time. Um, and the idea here is, if, say if you had a single threaded uh, system, if you executed queries one after another on a single thread, then there's sort of be this long queue of all these queries show up, and there's one thread that's going to pick the first query, execute it, then go to the next one and execute it, right? And that will be, that, that'll increase your latency because now you have to wait, you know, for whatever's in front of you to, to finish. But if we have all these extra cores, then any thread could be ex executing any of the queries from the queue, and they don't need to wait for each other. The tricky thing about this, and again, we'll focus, this, uh, focus on this later on when we talk about concurrency control, is what happens if those queries actually need to update the database? There's a, there's a very complex subject of figuring out what other threads are allowed to see if other threads are, or other queries are updating the database and make some changes. And that's, again, we'll spend two or three weeks on, on, that, on that topic. And I, that's my probably most favorite thing to talk about. And then the other type of parallelism will be intra-query parallelism. And that's what we'll have a single query will get broken up into uh, to subset, subtasks, and those subtasks will be executed by multiple threads or multiple processes or multiple cores in parallel at the same time. And so the advantage of this is that, say, you, if you have a really complex OLAP query that has to touch a lot of data, instead of having that single thread do the scan you know, in serial order or sequential order, you can have different threads scan different portions at the same time, and then the, the database system knows how to coalesce their individual results and compute the final answer you need to to the application. So uh, for today's class, we're going to focus on first talking about how you would design a database system at sort of a high level architecture level to support parallel execution or parallel operations. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, executing queries in parallel, and that'll be the, the sort of two categories that I mentioned before. And then we'll finish off talking about uh, how to achieve I.O. parallelism. All right, so to think of that, execution parallelism is how do we run things on different cores and take, take advantage of the actual computational power we have of a multi-core CPU. And then IO parallelism would be how can we take advantage of having multiple storage devices and reading data very quickly in parallel, okay? All right, so every database system is gonna have what's called a process model. And this is the high level organization of how the system is gonna be able to support multiple requests from 
from an application. So I didn't define this earlier, but I'm really talking about a, a database management system that supports uh, sort of a, a, you know, a, a multi-user environment. So think of like MySQL and Postgres and, and all, all the other database systems. Right? You have some database process running, um, on, and you can open up different processes or open up the terminals and start connecting to the database and interacting with it. So this is different than like a SQLite system, which is an embedded database system, which has to run in the process that is going to vote queries of it. There's no SQLite process running on your, on your, on your, on your laptop or on your, uh, on, 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 your, on your phone. Whatever application that needs to use the database is responsible for you know, invoking that library inside of it. So it's all the same address space. So we're really talking about an environment where, uh, again, there's some uh, always running database management system daemon running somewhere, and we connect to it with multiple terminals. So in this environment, we're going to define a, uh, a sort of a logical execution component of our database system. We're going to use the term worker. And the worker is responsible for executing the tasks on behalf of the client. So if I want to execute this query, we turn it to a query plan, and we have a bunch of operators, and that worker knows how to execute those operators and use all the algorithms that, that we talked about before. And then it produces some result and then sends, uh, and sends it that back to, to, to the application, to the client that asked for it. So there are essentially three, three different process models you can have. And I'll go through each of these one by one. Uh, so you have a process per database worker, you have a process pool, and then you have a thread per database system worker. So the first approach is where you have a inside your database system, you're going to have uh, the worker execute as a separate process. Again, when I say process, I mean like an OS process. Like when you, when you do an exec or a fork, right, it has a PID and its own standalone process. And then what will happen is there'll be this sort of one process that's called like the dispatcher, or in Postgres it's called the postmaster. Um, and as connections come in, the dispatcher figures out, all right, I need to execute this query. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to a worker. And now that worker is responsible for doing whatever it needs to do to, to execute that query on the database and then uh, s send back the result. Right? So again, Postgres does this. When, when, what happens is when you make a connection to Postgres, you always go to the postmaster, and then it hands you off to a worker, and that worker then goes back to the client and says, all right, I'm the worker for your, for your connection. Here's the, here's the socket where you can send any, any additional requests to me um, and execute the queries on behalf of the... Uh, on half of that connection and, and operate on the database system. So because we're in a multi-process environment, in order to allow different workers to communicate with each other, we either need to open up like an IPC channel, like a pipe, or we have to use shared memory to, uh, to have sort of a, a, a global address space that, we, that the different workers can write into and, uh, and communicate with each other. So the one advantage of this is that the if the worker crashes, like say something funky happens in your code, uh, because it's multi-process, that one, the, the, OS, the OS will kill that one worker process, but everything else can, can keep on running, right? Um, the downside, I would say, and I, I, have, I can't prove this yet, but this is something I think is, is worth investigating, is what's actually the overhead of using shared memory versus a, you know, a multi-thread environment. So I already said Postgres uses this. Uh, but this process model is also available in IBM DB2 and in Oracle. Yes? Yeah, so, so, so you said that crashes are supposed to be safe, but I think since you have shared memory, isn't that going to be a consistency issue if there's some critical section? So, he, so his, his statement is, and he's correct, his statement is that uh, if you're using shared memory between these different processes to communicate with each other, and you have one wor worker thread uh, go, go errant and has to, has to get killed, then could it potentially corrupt the, the, the shared memory data structure it was writing to at the time and therefore take down the entire system? Yes, that can happen. Uh, it you know, obviously depends on what the worker thread was doing, right? Um, the, there are some database systems, uh, I think Sybase is, is most famous for this, where they are they sort of have that fail fast policy and they're, they're careful about making sure when they crash a process, they don't take down the whole thing, right? Um, 
I don't, again, the full details is I don't know. And obviously, you try not to ship a database system that has faulty code, right? So to, you try to avoid that problem entirely. Um, the, so this is actually how most database systems were built in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, if you're going to build a new system today, unless you're based on Postgres, which a lot of systems are, you would not want to choose this architecture. And I'm going to take a guess why. Actually, let me phrase this. Why, let me phrase the question. Why did people choose to do, use this model in the 1980s and 1990s? Pthreads, exactly right. right? Back then, we have, we have, so we have POSIX threads now, and everyone knows how you know, there's a standard API that's, that can be used in Linux and, and other Unix variants. Back then, there was all these different threading packages, and they weren't portable. And so if you wrote, uh, you know, if you wrote your database system to use threads on one version of Unix or BSD, then it's not guaranteed that it would work everywhere else. Right? So back in the day, because multi-threading or threading, threading packages aren't what they are today, you had to go, a lot of systems went this route. So a alternative is to use a process pool. So it's just like before, where all the different workers are uh, run as separate processes. Um, and what will happen is you go to the dispatcher, and then the dispatcher is sort of the go-between the worker pool and the, uh, and the, and the application. So the dispatcher gets a, gets a request, and it says, all right, I'm going to hand this to one of my free workers, and they execute it, do whatever it needs to do, and then send the result back. And the, the, the dispatcher can try to be kind of smart about this in, in, in order to ensure cache locality. Uh, it'll make sure that the, if the same connection tries to send another query, it may try to use the, the, the same worker. So one thing I didn't talk about before, uh, but uh, it's relevant for both this and, and, and in the, 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 the worker model for the process model, uh, is that the all the scheduling of what worker threads gonna, you know gonna gonna wake up and execute for how long all that's handled by the operating system right because we don't have any we, you know these processes are just sort of running on their own we can provide hints to the OS and say you know this work this process may have a higher priority than another but it's still left to the OS to decide who, who goes what who goes next um, the other issue about this particular approach that can be bad is, is unless you're always guaranteeing that you're going to get the same worker process for every connection, you may end up with bad CPU cache locality because you're sort of jumping around. So uh, IBM DB2 also supports this. Uh, with Postgres, this is sort of how it works, but not quite. Postgres latest version, uh, and actually in recent years, they now support parallel query execution, which the kind of things we're talking about today. It used to be what happened is when the when your query showed up, the postmaster would hand you off to a worker, and that worker would be responsible for doing everything for that query: the parsing, the planning, the optimizing, then executing, getting the result, and then sending the result back to the application. And so that means that and this worker was a single thread. Uh, that means you couldn't run your query in parallel. And so in the latest version of Postgres, what they're able to do is they can recognize that uh, if I have a query that could take advantage of, of multiple threads or, or multiple processes, um, then they can try to find maybe a free worker in the worker pool and hand off a subtask of, of the query to that worker, who can then execute on behalf of the main worker, and then it knows how to call those results to produce, produce the correct answer. Um, so this is not quite how Postgres works, but DB2 has, has, a, has a, you can configure DB2 to work this way as well. The, the modern implementations or, mo or modern database systems actually don't use this process model. They instead use a multi-threaded model. Um, and what happens here is that for every single worker, you're going to execute that as a separate thread inside the, the main process of the database system. So it's all within the same address space. You don't need to worry about shared memory. Um, any thread can access anything. Of course, that has some downsides when we start updating the database, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll cover that cover that later. So, what happens in the here? The, the there's sort of a single process. There'll still be a dispatcher or, or a gatekeeper in the networking front end that gets the request and then knows how to hand it off to different threads to do whatever it needs to do. Um, the database managed system can now do all the scheduling at once. So it can control uh, uh, who you know what thread to wake up and, and allow to run. Um, 
Of course, the downside is that if you have a thread crash, then it takes down the whole thing. But of course, we said before, that may be also tricky to do. Um, it might be a problem as well in the, the process model. So I'm only showing four systems here, but I would say, again, every data use management system that, that has been come out in the last 10 years will be based on this model. Unless, of course, you're, you're building your system on top of Postgres, which a lot of them do. Um, we actually started, when we started building our new database system here at CMU, we did what everyone else does. We took Postgres and hacked it up to make it do what we wanted to do. And we actually spend time to get rid of the, the per-process execution model and get rid of the shared memory and switch everything over to be a multi-threaded architecture. It was a lot of work, and we ended up throwing all that code away. Um, but I, again, I, and I, and it's my opinion that this is the better approach, but I don't have any scientific evidence to say that this is, this is the right way to go. But this is typically what everyone does. So the one thing I'll also point out, too, here is in all three process models, I showed IBM DB2. Uh, and the reason because is IBM DB2 has to run on not only like Linux and Windows on standard, standard Xeon processors or their, they sell power machines, but also has to run on their like old school mainframes that run on ZOS. And, and in that environment, it's, you, you have all sorts of other things you don't have to deal with in, like in Linux, and they need to support any possible configuration that you, that you may be trying to run DB2 on. So DB2 of all these, in my opinion, is the most flexible that can support all these different process models because they need to run the mainframes plus on sort of standard commodity hardware. OK, so I sort of su summarized all these things before. Uh, the the multi-threaded architecture has several advantages over the other ones. Uh, the key one from a software engineering standpoint is that we don't have to manage shared memory. I suspect that would also be a uh, performance bottleneck in the OS, uh, but we haven't run that experiment. And then you also have less overhead now doing context switch because doing context switch between different processes is much more expensive to do in the OS than a context switch between threads within the same process. Um, but I'll also point out, though, regardless of what, uh, what process model or worker model, that I, the three choices that I showed before, uh, which one you actually end up choosing does not mean that uh, you can't do all the parallel execution stuff that we'll talk about here. Right? It's just the, the way you communicate between the different processes or, or threads for the different workers will, will be different. Um, and just because you're, you, know, you, you have a multi-threaded uh, architecture doesn't mean that you're going to get intraquery parallelism. In fact, MySQL works this way too, but MySQL can only execute uh, every query with a single thread, even though there's multiple threads av available to it. Uh, I haven't checked to see whether that's been fixed in or changed in MySQL 8, but as of MySQL 5.7, they can't do parallel query execution in the way that we're talk talking about here. Now, I, I've sort of glossed over this issue. Uh, I've mentioned it a little bit, but when it comes time to actually schedule the, the different uh, workers to execute a query, uh, there's a whole bunch of other questions <laughs> more than, uh, that we have to deal with other than just, I have, I have these tasks, I have these threads, I have these processes, go, go get it, right? Go, go let it run. Um, there's a whole bunch of extra stuff we have to figure out now in our query optimizer or query planner to figure out what level of parallelism we're going to want to have when we execute our query, right? So how many, how many tasks or subtasks we, should we break our query plan up into? Uh, then how many cores should be allowed to run for that query at the same time? Um, if you're in a uh, in-memory environment or if you have a NUMA architecture where you have multiple sockets, then you can also make decisions about you know, what task could run on what, what socket. And you want to do this because you want to minimize the communication between the two sockets. And then, of course, also, like, uh, when you execute a subtask in the query plan, it produces some intermediate result that you need to send to the next operator. Where should you actually store that? And so. Again, this is another example where the database management system is always uh, in the best position to make these kind of decisions. The OS can't figure these things out for us, right? The OS is going to say, all right, here's my task, and just let's go run. Uh, we have, since we know what the query plan is, and we know what we're trying to do, and we know what our data looks like, and we know what resources are available to us, we can always make ba better decisions about, about these sorts of things, right? So in the commercial systems, they have, uh, they have, uh, they expose different knobs and configuration uh, parameters to you as the database administrator to tune all these various aspects about 
uh, scheduling. Right? It's not just simply letting the threads run whatever they want. Um, and you can set up things like transaction priorities so that you say you, you, know, you say you have one query that's more important, and that it'll get more cores or more CPU than a sort of a query that's not 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 as important. Right? So all these things the commercial guys will expose to you, but we're not really going to cover that. All right. So any questions about process models? All right. So now, regardless of what process model we're using, now we can start talking about how we want to execute queries in parallel, or get parallel query execution. So the, as I said in the beginning, there's two categories of parallelism we're, we're going to go for. The first is inter-query parallelism, where the database management system will execute multiple queries simultaneously, um, rather than having one, one core execute them in, in sequential order. So now, if everything's read-only, then this is super easy to do because they just run and they don't interfere with each other. And you know, maybe you can be careful about making sure that if you have two queries that execute the uh, same scan, then maybe you want, you want to do sh uh, scan sharing that we talked about before, or maybe put them on, on the same socket so that you get better cache locality. Um, all of those things are still relevant, but it's not as hard as, as having to deal with multiple cores or multiple queries updating the database at the same time. Because the question is, again, what should one thread be allowed to see from another thread? Or what should one worker allowed to be see, uh, should it be allowed to see the modifications from another worker running at the same time? So all of this falls under the purview of what is called concurrency control. And again, that's a very, very hard topic. It's been studied for a long time. Um, not only is it, is it hard to, to get this thing to run correctly, it's also very hard to get this run very fast. Uh, so we'll start talking about this, I think, next week um, after the midterm. And again, this is like what uh, uh, the bulk of my research for, for several years has, has been re revolved about this. So there's not, uh, so I want to punt on this problem for now, but just sort of in the back of your mind, think about uh, as we go along that it's, this is, the challenges of this are easy if it's, if it's read-only, it's harder to do if it's if it's if you're updating things, okay. All right. So what I want to spend more time though is talking about intra-query parallelism, and the idea here is that we have a single query, ignore ignore simultaneous queries run at the same time. We have a single query, and we want to uh, execute its operations in parallel. Right? Instead of having one thread do all the work, we want to break it up into to multiple threads, and then so within intra-query parallelism. We can have two approaches. We can have intraoperator operator parallelism and then interoperator parallelism. And so these techniques, I'll say that they're not mutually exclusive, meaning we can, we can have any combination of, of, of these two together. Um, but the sort of the spoiler would be that most people, most database systems will implement the first one. And then the second one is typically used in an, another class of systems. So we'll talk about it. I'll talk about uh, in a few slides. And I'm also not going to talk about, in this, in this course, the algorithms uh, that allow you to execute the, the relational operators we talked about so far in parallel. So suffice to say that you know, external merge sort, hash join, sort merge, uh, sequential scans, index scans, all those things we talked about before, there are parallel versions of them. Um, and again, we'll, so in, in this course, we're not going to focus on that, but we'll cover this more in the advanced class in, in the spring. All right, so for intraoperative parallelism, uh, this is sometimes called uh, horizontal parallelism, what we're going to do is we're going to take a query plan, and then we're going to break up or, or take the operators in, in, and decompose them into individual instances that will execute the same function as the parent operator, or not the parent operator, the original operator, uh, but we can execute them on subsets of the data we're trying to access or, 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 or operate on and produce subsets of, of results, of intermediate results. So the way we're going to do this, and I'll show in the next slide what I mean by this, is that we're going to introduce a new operator into our query plan called the exchange operator. And this has nothing to do with relational algebra. Like this wasn't defined in the original paper from the 1970s. Right? This is something you would add to what's called the physical plan of the, of the query where we actually now define what algorithms we're actually going to use to execute the query plan. So the way the exchange operator is going to work, you sort of think this as a barrier 
or a location where all your child operators will send their results to, and the exchange operator knows that I can't send the results to the next guy or to the next operator of my query plan until I get all, I get all the results from, from my children. Right? Again, it's sort of this artificial barrier within the query plan that doesn't actually affect what the final result is. It's something you introduce to do, to do parallel execution. So let's look at a simple example. So we have a, a join query here. We're going to join A and B uh, on their ID key fields. And then we have two filters in our, uh, in our where clause for both a.value and b.value. And so the logical plan, after we're doing predicate pushdown, uh, would essentially looks like this, right? And you know, we could execute this on a single thread by just doing the scan on A, then, and, and then doing the join, or build the hash table, then do the scan on B, do the filter, and then, then do the probe on the hash table, right? We could have a single thread sort of do each of these steps one by one. But if you want to parallelize this, then the first thing we're going to do is we're going to target this, this first scan operator here. So now let's say that we can break up table A to three disjoint subsets, or three disjoint ch chunks. We call these partitions or shards earlier. That's typically what people use in a distributed system. But for our purposes, it's, it's fine. And so the way to sort of think about this is that this is the logical plan. And now what I'm going to show over here is the physical plan. So this is actually what the database system is going to execute. So for each of these scans, I'm going to assign them to a distinct core in our, in our system. So now we can execute all of these in parallel. Right, one core will do the scan on, on A, A1, the next one does the scan on A2, and the third one does the scan on A3. And then now also, too, we see that uh, we have this filter here. So we, there's, we can also have the threads immediately pipeline their data from the scan into the filter operator and produce, produce th those results. Right? And then we say now we want to get up and do the join. So we know we're going we're to do a hash join here. So all the threads now will take the output of the filter and start building their, their hash table. And so this is where the exchange operator comes in. Because the exchange operator is basically going to say, I can't do the join, or I can't start, yeah, I can't, I can't start operating on, on, on my join until I get all the results from the individual subset scans on A. Right? And typically, this is not done. You don't assign a core to say you're, you know, you're doing the exchange. It's just a barrier. The system knows that I can't proceed up in the query plan until all my three children produce whatever it is they, they, they needed to produce. So now I can do the same thing in B. And let's say B is a smaller table, and it only has two chunks. So we'll, have to, we'll assign two cores to, to do the scan, and then the filter, and then build the hash table. And then it, it also has an exchange. So once we know that the exchange on the left and the exchange on the right have, have been uh, satisfied, meaning we've gotten all the data we needed from our children, then we can actually now do the join, right? And produ produce a result. But now let's do the same thing. So now we want to do maybe the, 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 sorry, we do the join, we do the probe in the hash table. Uh, and then we also do our projection, and we, we do that in, um, and push it up to the final operator. So here, what I'm showing here is the join operator can actually be done in parallel. We'll assign different threads to execute the probe side of, of, the, the, of the join and produce our final result. And they all, again, get fed into a single exchange operator where you coalesce results, and now you produce the final answer. Right? So the exchange at the top is basically saying, I can't produce the final result to the client until all my subchildren have finished. Yes? So is the exchange operator in, in this diagram, all three exchange operators, these are implicitly on some core on their own, right? They're not on one of the children? So his question is, uh, is this exchange operator implicitly, actually, let me rephrase the question. Where is the exchange operator running, right? And the, typically the way this works is, um, there is like a you know like a like a accounting barrier inside of the exchange operator that says uh, that when a child operator completes the whatever it needs to do and says I I I've I've done all you want me to, uh, that I needed to do I'm not going to generate any more tuples for you it decrements that counter so once that counter reaches zero then whatever the thread that that last updated it can then update whatever it else needs to update to say go ahead and, and execute this right so typically you don't have a thread pulling 
say, did I get everything? Did I get everything? It's the last guy that finishes that then pokes the, you know, poke, pokes the whatever, you know, whatever else needs to happen after that, right? And so in this example too, what I'm showing is also a, uh, this is a partition hash join, which is sort of like the, think of like the great hash join we talked about before, where we, we would break things up into buckets so we could have, you know, the, each level of the hash table, we compare the bucket on the left and bucket on the right. You could sort of think of like the query plan being the same thing here. Say that we, we produce four levels of buckets in our hash table, and each thread will just do the join between each, each of those two levels, right? And you don't need to communicate between the different levels because we've already done that pre-partitioning ahead of time. So his question is, why, would the, why was this named exchange? Uh, think of like an exchange where like it's, it's like the central location that you need to call less results. If you call it an aggregation, that's sort of confusing because there's also an aggregation operator to do aggregations in SQL. So the exchange operator was proposed in the, uh, in the Volcano paper from the, the late 80s, early 90s. Remember we talked about the iterator model before? And I said that this is also sometimes called the volcano model. The volcano model also includes the definition of, of this exchange operator. And again, what that paper actually originally talks about is sort of codifying exactly how you want to do this. Right? People have done parallel query execution before, but he, uh, the, the author of this sort of laid out, the, the, you know, wrote down everything that you need to know about in order to do something like this. So I would also say, too, that this will come up later when we do distributed databases, because this is essentially how, how they work as well. And again, there's no direct mapping from the exchange operator from, from relational algebra to, to this, right? It's something artificial that you, you introduce in your physical query plan to, to, to move data around and, and make sure you have everything you need before you go to the next step. Okay, so the other type of, of inter-query parallelism is called inter-operator parallelism. This is sometimes called vertical parallelism, or I think in your textbook they call this pipeline parallelism. And the basic idea here is that we're going to allow the different operations in our query plan to execute simultaneously, and this will allow us to, to pipeline the output of one operator into the next operator and immediately do whatever processing we, we need to do on it. So I think, again, the visualization is the best way to see this. Right, so let's just focus on the join here. So ignoring about exchange operators and ignoring about running this join in parallel, let's assume that we're gonna assign a single core to execute this, this join operator. And say, again, say really simple, we're just doing a nested loop join. So this core is gonna spin through and it's gonna do the join on, between the outer table and the inner table. And then for every time it finds a match, it sends it up to uh, another operator, right? The, 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 the projection. And so this projection can now be sitting be being run with another thread or, or another core, and it, it's just blocked on its input queue from its child, and every single time it gets a new result, it immediately does whatever it needs to do, and then spits it up to the next part of the query plan. So the way to start to think about this is that you have all these threads running simultaneously, and they're just pulling on their input queue to find results, and every time they get something, they immediately operate on it. And then they go back and, and, and block on the queue again, right? So in this case here, this top guy, Every single time something comes in incoming, it does whatever it needs to do, and it comes back and waits to see, get the next thing. And then there's some control message or some control coordination you need to do to make sure that uh, when the join actually finishes, you notify the, the guy above and say, all right, you've got everything. There's nothing else you're, that's gonna come, uh, so go ahead and, and, and clean yourself up and finish. So as far as I know, uh, and I might be wrong about this, as far as I know, I don't think this is actually used in any uh, what I'll call traditional relational database management system. So traditional would be a system where like Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, right, where you submit a SQL query and it generates the query plan and executes the operators. Um, I poked around and I may be wrong, uh, but I, 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 I haven't seen anybody actually implement this. Um, and the reason is because not all operators can actually emit results until they get all the, the, the inputs from, from the children, right? For the join, 
to do a hash join, you can't start doing the probing until you, you've already built the hash table, because otherwise you may get a false, false negative. So it may be the case that uh, in our query plan here, say that we have different cores doing the scan on A, scan on B, and then we have a core at the top doing the, doing the projection. It's just waiting forever, right, until you actually get past to the join, until the join thing starts, starts producing anything. So you don't really get any, any, any benefit from that. And again, there's nothing preventing us from actually running the filter in parallel. It's just we don't have a thread dedicated or, or uh, something that's, that's pulling in queue waiting for, for input, right? When we get input, then when, when we know that the join is producing input, then we go ahead and get it. Another way to think about this, too, is like before, when we talked about the iterator model, we talked about calling next, 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 next down, and that was a blocking operator. Uh, where you pass control of the thread or the worker that's executing it from one operator to the next. Uh, in this case, it's, it's sort of like it's, there's some worker always doing calling next and it, and it waits. Where this model or approach actually shows up is actually in what are called stream processing systems or complex event processing systems. So these are or sometimes continuous query systems. And these are systems where you have like an input stream from an outside, outside data source where you're always getting new tuples, new data, and you want to process them on, on, you know, in an online manner and you know, produce, produce results. So sort of think of it like this. You say you want to do, um, if you just want to, you want to count the number of tweets you see, then you have the input stream is all the tweets, and every single time you see a new one, you just add one to a counter. And say you want to you know, maybe aggregate, aggregate them across window, different time windows. So in that environment, people set up these complex pipelines where you have different input streams coming along, and each operator is going to do some kind of uh, manipulation on that data and feed that into the next operator. So that's where you typically see, see this approach. Um, and so this Spark Streaming does this, and there's a whole bunch of, of other Apache projects, NiFi, Kafka, Storm, and Flink, that all sort of fall into the category of stream processing systems that, that do this kind of thing. OK? All right. so. One observation about this, of everything we talked about so far, is I've only talked about how to execute the queries in parallel at sort of a, a sort of computational level of having different CPU cores running different parts of the query plan at the same time. So all of this doesn't matter if the disk is always going to be super slow. Right? I could have as many cores as I want trying to you know, process the, the query in parallel, the different tasks. But if they're all going to the same spinning disk hard drive that can, that can you know, barely squeak out any data, then all those CPU cores are going to be blocked waiting for disk I.O. So the query parallelism stuff we talked about before is really great if everything's in memory, uh, not so great if you need to get things from disk. So, and also actually, actually too, is we're saying that you can actually make uh, performance actually worse by overwhelming the disk, if you have different cores or different, you know, different workers executing different parts of scans that are trying to get data at the same time, and the, and the, the disk arm is jumping around and you know, different parts of the platter, and and because it's all and it's all random access, and it's going to make things much much worse. So the way we need to solve this is through I/O parallelism, and the idea here is that we're going to take our database management system installation. And I chose those words very carefully. I'm saying database system installation and not database, because a database system can be comprised of multiple databases. Um, we're going to take our installation, and we're going to break up its storage across multiple devices. And there's a bunch of different ways we're going to do this. All right, so I'll go, go through each of these one by one. So for uh, the easiest way to, to, to get multi-disk parallelism or I.O. parallelism is just to configure either the OS or the, uh, the actual storage device um, to have multiple drives or mul multiple, uh, multiple hardware units. And typically, the way people do this now is you either have what's called a storage appliance. Think of like you buy a box that's dedicated to just doing, you know, being a file system machine, like a NAS or a SAN. Um, and inside of that appliance, you're going to have multiple disk drives, and it can run things in parallel. And then you can do this within your single machine, also using what's called RAID. Who here has heard of RAID? 
Ah, oh, most of you. Okay, cool. All right. So the, there's a bunch of RAID categories. It was actually invented by, or co-invented by Garth Gibson, who's a professor here at CSD when he was a grad student at Berkeley from the 1980s. Uh, RAID stands for a redundant array of inexpensive disks. Um, I think the I actually means something else now. Right? I think back then when they came up with RAID, it was inexpensive disks. And then all the hardware manufacturers complained and said, don't make it sound inexpensive because then people won't buy, you know, people think we're overcharging. Uh, so actually, what does it mean now? I forget. Independent. independent, thank you, yes. All right, so now it's run a redundant array of independent disks. Back then it, it was inexpensive. All right, so the basic idea is that uh, you're going to have multiple disk drives. It could be SSDs, it could be S uh, spinning disk hard drives, it doesn't matter. And there's a bunch of different configurations of how you can set up to store pages or, or blocks across these devices. So the first is, approach is called RAID 0. And the way this is called striping is basically that, say I have six distinct pages, and every drive will have one of those pages. So now let's say I, I do a sequential scan on my table, and I need to read, read pages one, two, and three. I can issue multiple simultaneous requests to the, to the storage layer, and the different drives can then go read them in parallel, because right, they're independent, and then shove them back up to the database management system. Right? And of course, the, so another approach also, too, is to get uh, what RAID 1 level, which is mirroring. So here now, I only have two pages. And now I have uh, every drive will have an, an exact copy of the page. There's a whole bunch of other configurations you can have to do uh, uh, parity blocks and other fault tolerant ways. RAID 0 and RAID 1 are sort of the most simple things, and there's more complex ones uh, at, at the higher levels. But the key thing to point out about this is that all of this is transparent to the database management system, meaning we don't have to modify any part of our code in our system to actually take advantage of this. The, the database system just thinks it has a faster storage device. Right? It can read, data much, read and write data much, much faster. Uh, and depending on whether you're doing, you know, you have mirroring or striping, that some might be better for OLTP workloads, some might be better for OLAP workloads. Uh, but in the end, again, we don't have to modify anything in, in, our, in our system. So that's kind of nice. The next approach is to do what's called database partitioning. And this is basically where we're going to take an entire database and we can assign it to one storage device. And we'll take another database and assign that to another storage device. And again, the OS, or sorry, the, the data dependent system may not necessarily know that it's dealing with different storage devices because you can do all of this at the file system level uh, without having to manage anything um, in the database system. Now, in the commercial systems, they'll, they'll support uh, sort of at, at, the, at the database system level, exact, they know exactly what storage device is being stored by database, right? In something like MySQL, you can just go into the, to the data directory. It's a big truck. Okay. You, can go, you can go into the database directory and you can just make sim links to different storage devices and MySQL doesn't know and doesn't care, right? Um, the tricky thing about this is that the, uh, the, the, the the log file is sometimes shared across multiple databases, and so that can't be on, you know, you can't shard that or partition that across each, each database installation, but you could also put that on a separate uh, hardware device as well. The last approach, and actually what he was referring to in the very beginning, is to do what's called partitioning. And so if you come from the, the NoSQL world, sometimes they call this sharding. Right? It's, it's sort, it essentially means the same thing. Uh, and the idea here is that we're going to take a single logical table in a database and we're going to break it up into disjoint subsets that are each, each managed and stored separately from, from each other. And whether that's on different storage devices or whether that's different uh, table heaps or buffer pools or whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, it's, up to, it's up to the database to decide how to do this. So ideally, partitioning at, the, at, sort of at this level, table partitioning, should be completely transparent to the application. So in the last two examples, when I said multi-disk for the database installation, or breaking the database, the different databases into different storage devices, again, all of that is transparent to the application. I write a SQL query, I don't know where the data is stored, and I, I don't need to do anything extra. In table partitioning, 
Ideally, it'd be, it'd, be, it'd be nice to have the, the, the application not know anything about partitions. It's not always the case. And a lot of times when people roll their own sort of distributed version of, my, of MySQL, right, they have to write their own sort of middleware layer or router to say, all right, this partition's at this node and go there. This partition's at that node, go there. Um, and then if you move things around, you have to change that, that, that router information. So not all distributed or parallel databases can, can support this, but typically uh, the, the, major, the major vendors actually can do this. So there's two classes of, of partitioning. The first is vertical partitioning, uh, where we're going to split up the table into uh, subsets where the attributes, or sorry, sorry, some set of the attributes we stored in one partition, and some sub subset of the attributes we stored in another partition. Right, so let's say that we have a really simple uh, table like this. It has four attributes. And say this, this last attribute here, attribute four, is a really, really large text field. And so that means that if I have any query that wants to do maybe just get the first three attributes and ignore the fourth one, if I'm doing a, a row-based uh, a, a row uh, storage model, or, or the, uh, the NSM storage model, then I have to go fetch the entire page and get all, all that data. Now, you can store the, the large attributes in a separate page, which for now we can ignore that. But you know, this would be bad because may, maybe I have to go get that, that fourth, fourth attribute every single time, and I'm never actually using it for my queries, and that's going to take up memory and slow things down. So what I can do is I can take this guy, move it over here, uh, and store it as a separate partition. And so now, anytime I have a query that only needs to access attributes one, two, and three, it can always go directly to this partition. If and when I need actually attribute partition four, then I know how to jump over there and get it from there. And again, I don't have to change anything in my SQL query. The database management system knows that these things are split up in this way and knows how to go get data uh, from the other guy. Yes? Would it have some algorithm for deciding which one to partition? Device to stop recording. Please just start recording. Sorry. Um, sorry. Let me fix this real quick, because otherwise people are going to play in on the internet. Well, it says it's still recording. I think it's OK. Yeah, what it says, device to stop recording. Please restart the recording. Is the counter still going? Yes. Then, yeah, you should be all right. All right. Screw it. All right. All right. Uh, so repeat your question. So this question is, uh, are there algorithms to decide which attribute to partition on? Yes. Uh, there are a ton of them. I've written one. Uh, my advisor's advisor written, wrote one in 1979. Uh, there's a ton of different things. Um, the, another, way, another way to think about this, what does this look like? What, what is this, we've already talked about this before. What does this look like that I'm describing here? Column, column store, exactly, yes. So in a column store, uh, typically, they'll store everything as, a, as its own partition, right? Uh, some data systems that, that support this uh, can, ha like, so the, usually the commercial guys will support something like this, done at the database system level. And they provide some tools where you feed it in, some workload trace, and it, it can make, help you make decisions about where to do this partitioning. Uh, in, in other systems, this is usually done at manual, manually, but also done at the application level. So this is actually what Wikipedia does, right? So the way Wikipedia stores their, uh, their revisions for, the, for, for, you know, for every article, they actually partition it in between different tables. So you have one partition has, or sorry, one table has the metadata about the revision, and then they have another table that has actually the text of the revision. So that essentially is doing the same thing, but now in your application code, you have to write a query that knows how to join them together if you ever need to get actual the text, right? What I'm describing here, well, you wouldn't have to do that. Everything's done, done for you, you know, internally, and the same queries can, can you know, operate without you know, worrying about there's data here versus data there. Uh, so the original question is, the commercial guys have tools, the open source guys don't. But not all open source systems can, can support this kind of partitioning. OK. What is, what is most common, and what most people think about when they say partitioning, is called horizontal partitioning. And again, when people refer to sharding in a NoSQL system, they're talking exactly about this. So here what we're now going to do is rather than splitting it up on a, 
and storing some set of the attributes over one location, some set of the attributes in another location. We're going to store all the attributes for tuples together, but we're going to split them up so that some partitions have some tuples and some partitions have another tuple. So let's say here I have four tuples in my table, and let's say I just split it up in the middle, and partition one will have tuple one and two, partition two will have tuples three and four. And then now up above in my, in my database system, when a query comes in, I have to figure out, oh, it, it needs to touch data that's at partition, sorry, it needs to touch tuple three, so I know I need to route my query to go run on partition two, right? And so the way you now decide how to split up your table uh, into these hor horizontal partitions, there's a variety of approaches you can do. Uh, hashing is probably the most common one, where you pick some attribute, hash its value, mod by the number of, of, of partitions you have, and that tells you how to, you know, what, where to go. You can also do range partitioning. Uh, predicate partitioning would be if you have a more complex predicate you want to use. This is called interval partitioning, where you sort of is like, like a ranges. So there's a whole bunch of, of techniques to do this. There's a ton of papers going back to the 1970s on doing this. Um, and again, the commercial guys will have tools to help you with this. The, uh, the open source guys, it, it require, it's a manual process. So we'll cover this in way more detail when we talk about distributed databases, because th this is essentially what he was referring to in the beginning is, well, what's a partition and, you know, is, what does that actually mean? It's typically this, right? And if you think about it again from a, from a, if you're doing a large table scan, uh, then you can run them in parallel to different partitions. If you're doing a transaction, then you can route the transaction or, or doing update to the database. You can route the one partition and not worry about coordinating with the other partition. There's a whole bunch of advantages of doing this in a distributed and parallel system. But it brings up a whole, more a whole bunch of other complications because now you need to worry about um, uh, if you ever have to communicate changes between different partitions, how do you make that actually be fail safe? So again, we'll, we'll worry about that in a few, in later in the semester when we talk about distributed databases. But this is essentially what I was sort of talking about before when I showed the, with the exchange operator, when I said, oh, the table A will be broken up to three chunks, I was, I was meaning these horizontal partitions. So you could have one scan operator instance, scan partition one, another thread could be scanning partition two, and then the exchange operator will, will coalesce the results. Okay, uh, so to finish up, uh, parallel execution is important, parallel execution is, is hard, um, but in almost every single data management system you can think of will support some variant of, of parallel execution. At the very, at the very uh, least, they'll support inter-query parallelism, where you have multiple queries running at the same time. Uh, and then the, the more sophisticated systems can support intra-query parallelism. We can take a single query, break it up into subtasks, and have them run at, at the same time. So as I talked about th that throughout this entire uh, lecture, there's a whole bunch of other things we have to deal with in order to make sure we get this right. How do we coordinate things? How do we schedule the threads? How do we deal with threads updating the, the data or tables at the same time? How do we deal with you know, threads? You know, one thread wants to, wants to take a ton of memory, another thread needs to use memory, but it doesn't have any more. It's a whole bunch of those things that we have to deal with um, that we're not going to cover in this course, but we'll cover in, in the advanced course. So one thing should be, to mind, think, or be mindful about for actually for project three in, uh, in this class when you end up building uh, a lock manager or, or a concurrent control algorithm for your, for your storage manager in SQLite, SQLite is multi-threaded, so they support inter-query parallelism, but they don't support inter-query parallelism for virtual tables uh, if you go through the SQLite uh, command line terminal. We'll write an application or a test case that spawns multiple threads and allows you to modify your virtual table in parallel, but you can't test it in parallel from the command line, because right? there's no way to write SQL from the command line to invoke multiple threads. The other thing to be mindful about SQLite is that it allows inter-query parallelism for reads, but it does not allow for inter-query parallelism for, for writes. So it'll have multiple threads can run uh, query, uh, read-only queries in parallel, but only one thread can write to the database at the time. And they do this because it makes concurrence control, which is what we'll talk about next week, way, way easier. And it makes the system more portable. Okay? So any questions about, about parallel execution? All right, so next class. It's the midterm. 
And I'm serious. Like one year we had like, oh, I thought you were joking about the midterm. Like, no, it really is uh, next class. So please come, OK? I also have, uh, if you didn't get a copy of this, I have a copy of the, of the, the practice exam with solutions. So please come to me right afterwards if you, if you want to get a copy of this. And then on Monday next week, we'll have what I'll call a potpourri session where there's a whole bunch of interesting topics about that you need to have in a sort of a database system that's actually usable by people. Uh, that I don't know if it's all covered in the textbook, but there's a whole bunch of t things I, I want to sort of cover. So these are sort of be a hodgepodge of topics that are maybe aren't connected all together in a single theme, but these are things you sort of need to have if you want to build a modern system. So we'll do stored procedures, uh, UDS or user-defined functions, user-defined types, triggers and views, and materialized views. All right, and that'll be m Monday next week. Any questions? All right, guys. Uh, see you on Wednesday.